Originally, you were told to fill out cards for questions, but Congressman Fulcher has said he'll just field questions from the audience. So we're not going to worry about the cards. So go ahead and shout them out when that time comes. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and to be able to introduce the Congressman. He is what I would describe as a true statesman, a man who puts the responsibility of office before self, who is deeply concerned about the future of this country and our state, and is uh, doing a fine job of being a courageous representative for us back in Washington, D.C., and especially in this climate now, it's not an easy thing for a member of either party, but especially being a member of the minority party and trying to work for your constituents, and he's been doing an excellent job doing that. And, uh, he's somebody I'm very proud to call friend, and I'm very thankful that we have him as our congressman. So I'm going to step out of the way right now, but if you would help me in welcoming our congressman, Russ Fulcher. That, that was way too kind, and I'm very, very thankful for Sage and, and uh, the work that he does here locally. Other elected officials that are here? Any others? I, I know we've got one coming here. <laughs> Ken, thank you for what you're doing. Ken Lawrence, just appreciate you and, and wish you the best and uh, appreciate you and your help and support for me as this has gone on. Is there any other uh, elected officials or candidates? Yes. Um, Council of Andre. Thank you. And just uh, your name so that Gary it's Kuzman. Gary Kuzman. And so we met just a minute ago, but thank you for what you do. And I'm rerunning for uh, re election. Re uh, and, and that's <laughs> what, is the, what is the date? Uh, November 5th. November 5th. It's close. It's close. So good. So I've, I've said this before, but I'll say it to all of you. I think in many ways, local government is the most difficult. And the reason I say that is you make decisions in the face of constituency. And uh, I do it with about a 3,000 mile buffer. <laughs> and Sage does it with 400 mile, 400 mile buffer. <laughs> so, uh, but never, you know what though? It's, the, the system is, is certainly everything but optimal, but uh, it's, it's the best that's, that's out there. And um, I've had the privilege of working with Sage for a number of years and have nothing but the most high regard there. So you're very well represented in the area. Um, it is a privilege to be here. And it's a privilege to represent you in Washington, D.C. I wish that things were a little bit different there. Um, so I am a, a veteran of 10 months. I feel like it's 10 years. Um, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, over-dramatize things, but I don't want to understate it either. Um, understand the perspective. It's from a, a freshman member of Congress in the minority party. But I do think we are probably in the most a time of where there's more conflict there than maybe any other time since it wouldn't be as much as a civil war. But uh, probably more so than in the Nixon years, more so than in the Clinton years. I don't know about Jackson, but it's, it's very, very tense. And the series of events that's led up to where we are right now is, uh, has, has just huge ramifications. I've got 44, 46 pieces of legislation that I'm either sponsoring or co-sponsoring, and only one of those bills is moving. And that's not unusual, but I think most members would say that. That's because those things aren't getting attention. What's getting attention is efforts to try to remove this president. And, and it started literally on, on day one in, in his case. But we continue to go through these motions of uh, one, one charge versus the next. Uh, for the longest time, it was some kind of obstruction, it was some kind of collusion, it was some kind of tax return, it was a Mueller report, all these things. And now it's, it's Ukraine. And uh, um, I would just say that, that there, there's another conflict that doesn't seem to be reported in the press that is probably the most troubling for me. And that is how the intelligence community and senior law enforcement has 
in many ways just refuse to be accountable. And that is what is that is what's transpired in, in in a lot of these cases. And we have I, I I'm gonna just use a theory and I don't know if it's really true or not, but I think if you go back to the Patriot Act, which transpired shortly after 9-11, that broadened much of the authority of the law enforcement and the intelligence community. And when that came into place, there seems to be an attitude where there's just no desire to be accountable to the president, no desire to be accountable to Congress. And um, that's problematic. That is very problematic. Um, I don't think there's any question that the, how, how, this, how this president governs is, is not always the, the most tactful way. But regardless of who is in that leadership role, um, I, I think I would be just as opposed to some of these actions if it was President Obama. But it's, you know, the, the way this is being handled is just not right. We're in a time where we've got the best economic figures in my lifetime with unemployment the way it is, with our, our, our trade situation, uh, with the, the energy exports that we have, we're in a stronger leverage position than we've been in a long, long time. And that may sound good, but in many ways that's bad. And here's, here's why. When you have a tremendous amount of, of, of leverage internationally with your trade, energy exports, that makes you a target by many other nations outside the country. If an administration is doing very, very well in the sense of there's economic growth, those types of things, that makes the opposing party that much more determined to, to, uh, to come after you. Those are, all just, those are all just facets. For us, for <coughs> our office, for me, probably the best thing that we've been able to do is just with our constituent service group. Uh, Mike Cunnington is here, Clinton Daniels here, uh, Terry Seymour is here. These are all people who uh, they they work through the specific issues in offices within Idaho that they navigate problems people have in various agencies and um, Medicare issues or, 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 tra or, or uh, uh, passport issues or veterans issues, whatever it might be. That's probably the biggest impact we've been able to have at this point. And there's been some significant wins on that front. Uh, but things right now are not likely to happen legislatively. And, uh, and it's because of that overall dynamic that we're just working through. I think maybe I'll just kind of stop right there and just open it up. And, and if you've got counsel, you've got questions, you've got comments, I encourage you to, to do that. Here's what I would ask. If, if there is something that's um, really bothering you, it's problematic, please understand this. I have no monopoly on wisdom, okay? And uh, uh, I can share with you a perspective and what I've done or what I haven't done. Uh, but if you have a, a real issue with something, please tell me. I would also ask that you follow it up with a solution or at least a proposed solution, what you think is the right answer in those cases, and then we can discuss that. But, um, yeah. What about this star card that we have to get in a year? Is, do we have to have it, or could you use a, 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 a can you use a pass? Or, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, the star card. Yeah, pass. Uh, my understanding, uh, and uh, you, Sage might know this better than me, but I think there's until 2022? Mm -hmm. No? It's no? next year. 2020. 2020. 2020. Okay, 2020. <clears throat> I uh, either have to use a star card to travel right. or a passport. Right. Could use a passport. Yeah, so, and the passport is ongoing, so you don't need to convert over to that if, if you don't want to. But if you want to travel, then you need a passport as a function of that. But yeah. I'm glad you mentioned this 3,000 mile buffer <laughs> because I want you to put that away yeah. and think of us here. Yeah. And as a lawyer, I've always been particularly interested in the rule of law. 
So I ask, do you believe the elected officials are subject to the rule of law? Oh, no question. Yeah. Well, yeah. most in the room would agree with that. But then how can you oppose and discount the inquiries into impeachment? Without a vote. You don't have to. <laughs> Cool. There, there's, there's, there's two issues that are coming up there, but um, in this particular case, you just have to ask yourself what is, what is grounds for impeachment? And the short answer is impeachment or grounds for it is whatever Congress says it is. And that, that's exactly, I mean, there, there's no hardened definition for it. I went through the, the transcript, in fact I've got a copy of it, I'd be happy to get one to you if you want it. I went through the so-called whistleblower report, and at least to me, putting that in, into perspective, I don't see I don't see something there that is worth remo removing a president. I do see, and what's come out of this is a significant uh, amount of other things that. That give that certainly give me pause, but I think at least part of what you're talking about, and I, I certainly can understand the the concern. There's there is so much frustration because other things aren't being attended to, and we've got some pretty good indicators on what most people, I think, what 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 most people think about. All right, is is something impeachable? Is it not? the other issues of the corruption that have popped up, the concerns, the fact that we're not getting a lot of other things done because of all the focus on this. But I, I understand the frustration. I and how about in the back? You know what? I agree with her. I'm sure also, and I I'll try to I'll try to uh, respond to that this way. Um, the strongest pro is that this president has been so disruptive, and there are there is an established network of agencies, bureaucracies, even some elected officials that has kind of built these systems into place. And then this guy comes along and disrupts it in a lot of ways. Some people say it needed to be disrupted. And that's, I, I, think, I think that's some of the fervor that support the president. You know what, this place needed to be turned on its ear. And then there's, there's those who say, wait a minute, he's completely just that disrupting things that are making things unstable. And so depending on where you you fall on that, that's probably that's on the pro side because it, it really the Ukraine thing is number nineteen out of you know a whole series of things that that continue to get cycled up. Um, the biggest con is probably the same argument, but I would add to it uh, probably one of the biggest frustrations on, on my side is if we're going to do this, then let's use due process, and that's not being used. Um, the, the chairman that started the inquiry opened with a, a, a totally fictitious mm -hmm. backdrop for it, and uh, that's 
that's not right. And and I there's not the support right now. I don't think in the in the entire chamber for impeachment in my in my view. I just don't think it's there. That's probably why the speaker opened things the way he did. And you're right. Uh, she doesn't have to go through the full vote. Uh, in, historically, that's kind of been the precedent because you want to see, you know, where the where the support is before you do it. But um, that would be, be my best response, I think, to, to both of them. What, I, well, there's a lot of people with questions. I think you had one, too. So, yeah. Todd Engel. Yes. I'd like to get an update on him. If you've talked to Larry Wooten, uh, anything else that may be happening that we could tell him and his supporters? I can't, I can't tell you everything on that. But what I can tell you is uh, there have been conversations with uh, Mr. Wooten, and there's more scheduled. And that is being pushed through the appropriate channels without, uh, without, without doing anything inappropriate to court orders and without breaching anything classified. It's all being very regimentedly uh, followed through, but it is being pursued. That's, that's the best answer I can give you. It's, it's not being, it's not idle. It, it's a tough answer for Todd, but it's, it's something. It, it is something because um, it's being addressed in all the right ways. And so just stay tuned on that, okay? Yes, sir. Are you concerned about our abrupt withdrawal from Syria? I am. Um, that is so complicated, and there's, it's so dynamic. Uh, on the one, on the one side, and I, I understand the president's argument, and I, I have some. Uh, I, I can relate to that. On the one side, he's he's making the point: look, we've we've been involved with this for so long, and this isn't our fight, and um, it's it's time to withdraw. If you if you weren't aware, there's less than a thousand troops now that's involved with this, so it's a, actually a relatively small group that's still there. The flip side, and and I would say one of the things that maybe concerns me a little bit is is. Uh, the, the Kurds did help us uh, significantly in getting ISIS under control. And um, uh, there is intelligence, if you will, that says if, 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 if we in totally remove ourselves, then they regain steam. So I guess, in fairness, I don't know the right answer there. But I am concerned about it. Um, However, I would also add, I don't have a, I have a son who's 26 years old, and uh, I might be thinking different of it myself if he was, if he was there. So I, I, I completely get that <coughs> argument and don't want us to be strung out in the Middle East and other places where we don't have to be. Uh, I also remember what took place on 9-11 and, and a lot of the forces that may enable that to be possible and I don't want to see that come back. And so um, I respect the leadership in the sense that, yeah, uh, there's probably no harder decision than or a harder phone call to take or to make than when you're talking to somebody who just lost a life there. But uh, I am concerned about it. if. Um, We'll see how that plays out. I think there's one thing that there is broad support for, and that is pretty much everyone has has uh, unified around the uh, the policy that if if Turkey does move in there and execute on some kind of a mass scale, uh, that there needs to be some strong ramifications. But yes, I'm, I'm personally concerned about that. Yes. Sir. Uh, according to the talking heads, the latest uh, talking points of the Democrats is there 50 to 100 bills on the clowns that the desk has been passed out of the House is this 50 to 100 bills on McConnell's desk? It's been, been passed on the digital. It's been passed by the uh, That's, I don't know if the number's accurate, but I know there's a lot of them. Yeah. 
And so, uh, and and personally, there's a lot of my hopes stay there. Um, so, uh, there's been some, in in my view, some things that have have come through the house that I just so don't become law. And uh, I guess that's why you've got the the balancing power of government on both sides. On the one hand, it's it's. It's very, very frustrating because it's hard to get something done. On the other hand, this system wasn't created to be easy. It was created to be very, very difficult. And it is. For for those reasons. Yeah. How about let's go over was there one over here? Yes, sir. So first thank you for coming. Appreciate you guys thank coming you come into uh, Bonner County. Um, I'm also an advocate of the rule of law, and I, and I disagree with you. I have some serious concerns with the current administration, but um, what's your view is um, obstruction of justice, is that an impeachable offense? Um, I don't know that I can give you a straight up answer on that. I would need more detail on it. Um, if, if we are, if, if we are um, blocking or if, or if someone is is uh, uh, blocking justice, well, if Congress uh, has taking place, issued legal subpoenas and those are being refused, is that a problem? Um, th you know what? I, I let me answer it this way. I don't know that I can give you the legal response. What I can give you is the practical application of what's going on. These hearings are not set up to be balanced. They're not set up to hear both sides. Even the time for, for questioners and the participants is not open. And I can, I can understand why there's pushback on that. And it's both ways, by the way. Uh, if you've heard some of the things that you know, Lindsey Graham is trying to do on the other side, and, and he's getting stonewalled just the reverse. Uh, some of the bar inquiries. Uh, this is a, it's a two-way street. And um, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to give you the legal. You're the congressman. The legal, you're, you're the, the one legal who gets stall. to vote on this. So <laughs> but I, I, would, I would say this. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see the um, the concern on obstruction, and neither did Mueller. So, um, if if that was if that's the, I the that. sense, I politely disagree with you. But and I, I respect that. I I, I really do. Yes. Uh, there's a strong precedence uh, to having a vote before impeachment of the other two impeachments that have played through had a vote in the House of Representatives. So why can't the Republicans push harder for that? Uh, I'm not sure how much harder can be pushed. I mean, there's a, I know that's been petitioned, the, the legal and the uh, uh, parliamentary moves have been made just in minority. And so when you're when you're that's the point and by by the way um, the speaker of the house is the second most powerful person in the nation uh, unlike on the senate side there's the, the speaker has authority that that no one really else has with the the ability to control the agenda identify the chairman identify the membership of the various committees and uh, uh, the speaker is in a position where, you know, she just she doesn't have to, and I think there's probably a couple reasons why she didn't. Number one, I don't think there's the full support in the in the entire body for it at this point, and she didn't want to, that to be reflected. Number two, there is a number of swing districts in the upcoming election that, good, bad, or indifferent people would have to put a marker in the ground and say, okay, this is where I'm at on this. And there were some of her members that just don't want to do that. And so and number three, she would have to let the Republicans have a say. 
there would be some open floor debate on yes. that front. So that's probably true. Yeah. Yes. On the, if we get a verdict on the Texas versus on the Affordable Care Act lawsuit that's pending and probably going to get an answer pretty soon, can you tell me about the plan to replace a, the Affordable Care Act, or what do us folks on Obamacare look forward to, or if it's gone, if it's there, pulled out? There, there is a health care reform. There's several health care reform drafts. There are several health care reform bills. <laughs> And to that end, there's uh, health care and immigration are the two issues that, outside of impeachment now, are the two issues that we traditionally get the most feedback on, have for a long, long time. And there are alternatives that are available for debate on both, but we can't get those on the agenda. And by the way, bipartisan. And I know because I'm on a working group for both of them. The approach that's at least on the table with the Affordable Care Act is not a full repeal. It, it is a series of market-based um, alternatives that have to do with uh, everything from there's a health care savings component, the, a tax reform, there is a um, uh, health care membership component, there is a, a pharmaceutical uh, cost reduction component, so here's, yes, it's out there, question, but it's not. It's not a. It's not a full repeal. Is it age? Is there an age rating component? Is there a rate ban component? Do you know those answers? I, I don't know what those terms. The, the okay. second one. And would someone in your office be able to answer that if I we, contacted we, we you We can later? we can get you the the draft that's at least on the table. Okay. And I have to be good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but you know, frankly, the overall point is is that those are the kind of things we should be talking about, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Uh, and we're not. Um, so, um, I think there's a couple. Yes, sir. Uh, in the, um, we the citizens do not elect people in the intelligence uh, mm -hmm. offices. Who was responsible for changing the law that a whistleblower does not have to have, you know, personal knowledge? Because in industry, if you are a whistleblower working for a market, you have to be an eyewitness to this. But now you have someone change the law that says you can have hearsay. Well, who is the one responsible for that? I don't know that the law changed, but I can tell you um, when someone has the ability to, to formulate a charge and put that forward, that I don't know that, that – um, I don't know what those parameters are and um, what qualifies as whistleblower or not. But you raise a point that I think needs to be discussed a little bit further, and I, I tried to open with it a little bit, but this is where it becomes the most troubling for me because on the, the law enforcement front, on the intelligence community front, it almost feels like they've created a, a like a almost like a fourth branch of government, and are functioning in a way that really is not accountable. And so when you insert a, a Congress that is starting to demand that accountability, and it's not happening, and then a president who, who comes in and, you know, with his style that only he has, uh, starts firing people or whatnot, then all kinds of resistance starts coming to play. And that's exactly what's playing out right now. Because as a sub, I've been a substitute teacher, and one of the great fears of the teacher was, you know, with kids being very smart alecky, you could have a fourth grader say, if you don't give me an A, I'm gonna say you touched me. So as yeah. a male teacher, you live in fear of a accusation that could be totally false. Yeah. But as a male teacher, your whole life could be destroyed by a hearsay thing. So it's very important that people do not get branded and destroyed by this thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's a very good point, Alan. And I, I wish I had a better response, but I think that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. What can we do here to best assist you in what you do for us out there? <clears throat> Um, 
I made a statement a little bit ago, and I meant it. Um, I have got mon no monopoly on wisdom. And uh, as, as, we, as we go through these things, some of, uh, some of the, not just on this, but on many other issues, resource related issues, uh, healthcare related issues, immigration stuff, the components that I've championed, and in many cases the components around the table, weren't my ideas. They were ideas that came from people in the district or legislators from, from our state. And so I would encourage you, uh, if you've got thoughts or ideas, please share them. Uh, Terry Seymour is a, a young lady in the pink back there, and she's, she uh, uh, works out of the Coeur d'Alene office. She's full-time. You haven't met Mike or, or uh, Clinton, but they're right here. Uh, contact one of us and just share those thoughts. You know, if you're, uh, I would say this too, if you're a person of faith, appreciate some prayers. Um, I think that we've been blessed as a result of, of uh, our, our Christian principles in this nation. And uh, I covet those, those prayers. So those, those are a couple thoughts right there. So thank you for asking that. Yes. It was very disturbing uh, listening and watching the, the chef's little uh, presentation, the statement. Why did it take a half hour for any Republican to try to bring to light that perhaps that may not be the truth? Do we have some mechanism? I know we aren't in the House of Commons. I mean, stand up and scream. I think somebody tried to have a <coughs> speech yeah. one time, but there's got to be some way for somebody to interject themselves when there's clearly lies being told into the record. I think probably a lot of the members may have been dozing, but they weren't there. But it is in the congressional record. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is there any? Is there no mechanism for somebody to interrupt a, a speech that is blatantly a lie? You know. Um, I wasn't in that. I'm not on that committee. I wasn't in that hearing. I, I got uh, I got the rundown on it shortly thereafter. So I, I don't know what the ex exact timing was. Uh, Devin Nunez is is he's somebody that I've gotten to know reasonably well. He's a ranking member on that. And uh, procedurally, uh, the chairman has X amount of time to communicate. Then that time reverts to the ranking member, and so on and so forth. So. Um, so there, there is, there should be the ability immediately thereafter to make statements, and I don't know how how long that took. Uh, I can tell you that there's <coughs> more than 90 signatures uh, on a uh, resolution right now uh, requesting the censure of Chairman Schiff exactly for that reason, and I'm one of the signatures. And uh, you know, uh, maybe it should have been done quicker. Uh, it probably won't result in anything, but it was, uh, it, to your point, and <coughs> one of the bothersome things about it is many people who don't follow it very, very close actually think there was, it was factual, and it was not. It was, it was entirely not, and so inappropriate and I think worthy of censure at best. Probably should have been done quicker. But somebody who hasn't asked a question, and then we'll, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Shortly after the uh, Chairman Miller uh, came out with his, uh, his uh, determination there was no collusion and all that stuff, why the uh, Attorney General Barr uh, declared that, uh, that, he, that he was going to investigate uh, the spying done by, uh, supposedly the spying done by the, by the opposite party of the, of the President uh, during the pre-election time and putting spies into, the, uh, into his cabinet and and all kinds of things. And uh, every time I turn on the TV lately, uh, 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 about two months ago, they said, oh, that's going to be really, that, that Attorney General Barr is going to release that next week. <laughs> and then uh, just the other day, they uh, heard some guy say, oh, it's going to come out in about 10 days. <laughs> well, my, my question for you is, you probably don't know any more about it than I do, but <coughs> if you have any clue at all when this is going to come forward, because uh, there's, uh, there's all of this uh, one-sided negativism now about uh, impeach, impeach, everybody's impeached, all the news, all, everybody in the world wants to impeach. What about Barr's uh, report? Do you know anything about it or have any I, idea at all? I, I know that it's proceeding. I don't know what the timeline is on it. I also know that <coughs> it will never get the same amount of focus through media channels because it's, uh, it's, it's not in the 
when it's made popular. Very that will so, <coughs> so uh, but it, it will continue. <coughs> and, uh, you know, we're in a war here. Um, and it is, it is truly, a, I, I think there's a spiritual component to it. I think there is, certainly there's a principle-based component to it. But, uh, and, and very clearly, people dig in on one side or the other on it. Eventually, to work through this, we're going to have to figure out how to bridge some of these gaps. And in the overall scenario, there's two very, very polarizing figures. One is Trump and one is Pelosi, and they are not compatible. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's, had a, that's had a very, very divisive impact on it. I'm on these bipartisan working groups, and when, in, in, up until I'd say the last 10 days, we really were somewhat able to sit down at a table and start grinding through issues and, and find common ground on a lot of this stuff. Since, uh, I'd say, the last 10, 14 days culminated, even that, it's, it's difficult because everyone is, is all concerned about, well, wait a minute, how am I going to fall in on this thing? Am I going to be you know, pro impeach, not impeach? Uh, <coughs> unhealthy time yeah, on that front, but uh, it, it's huge, hugely impactful. Yes, sir? Was, uh, that vote is covered up on the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. I'm sorry, what? The vote's covered up oh, on the uh, United yes. States, Mexico, Canada yes. agreement. That document is over 2,000 pages long. I'm sure the president has not read this. The same people in the bureaucracy who put this together are the same people that wrote the Trans Pacific Partnership and everything. And this merges the United States with the governments of Canada and Mexico, and we lose our sovereignty. Where do people stand on this? Because once we get into this thing, and once this thing, should this thing pass Congress, it's written in this document that they can form their commission, and they can go in and change anything they want. We're done as a nation. And this is exactly the same way that they built the European Union. And Britain can't even get out of the damn thing. We're going to get sucked into this, and there's no way out of it. So here, here's one thing that would help me. If you've got some specifics on that, then please, uh, let's just figure out a time to get some staff. And look, I want to hear the specific concerns. I can tell you that if this thing goes, if this thing gets on the agenda, it's going to pass. And it's going to pass in a very large bipartisan fashion. And we're done as a nation. And and, uh, and honestly, I haven't seen that. Uh, however, I'm, you know, I'm I'm very open to the to the, to the detail. Do the people who vote on this. Do they read the 2,000 page document? There's stuff in there that's bad. I mean, really bad. I have got I have got this U.S. USMCA right. Right. I have got that. I can tell you, I haven't read the full 2,000 pages. By the time we vote on it, I will have. Right. But yeah. I can tell you the general mindset, and it's highly supportive. The uh, um, ag interest, the dairy interest, the, the uh, pretty much the, the, the major components, both Republican and Democrat, are, are supportive of it. So, but to your point, please share those specifics with me. I'll learn. Okay, and I need I need to know that I need to know that and learn that. In first my estimation, it's worse than after. We'll never we're finished. If we get entangled in this thing. We'll never be able to get out of it. Okay, so I, I'd I'd like to get some detail with you, and we'll make sure that we get a chance to do that. Okay. Yes. You recently voted for HR ten forty four, which puts caps on each one of these pieces. Um, it has a companion bill in the Senate. As we which is co by Camel and Okay, so bear with me, but uh, I'm not, not sure I remember the numbers, so. Um, uh, it lists, it, it basically creates a flood of new imported labor to replace tech workers. And it's a big payoff to big tech. And I'm trying to figure out why you would vote for that. Especially a bill that's co-sponsored by Kamala Harris. <coughs> that makes it suspicious on its face. Yeah, and you know, frankly, I, 
I'm not screwed. In, I'm, I'm, I'm not screwed in the question, but I'm not. I'm not familiar with the content. That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, and I. What, what I need to do? What I need to do is. I don't know that. Workers with foreigners that are imported. I. On that surface, I don't think that I would. So. I just don't understand it. So let's let's make sure that. You've got in front of me what, what this was because okay. I, I don't this recall that. Country caps for H one B visas. Those are supposedly tech tech visas to bring in technical people. Mm -hmm. I used to own a software company and I know that the H one B process is a, is a joke. It's a sham. Yeah. You pretend yeah. that you really can't find anybody. But what you want is cheap labor. I would like to tell you that I know exactly what you're talking about and I remember that. But I don't. I don't remember that debate. I don't remember that that vote. Oh, it's, so um, it's potentially brings in hundreds of thousands of tech workers, which potentially replace a lot of Americans doing those jobs. Okay. And so I, so before we leave, let me um, let's make sure that I get the 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 bill number and we just track it down and I'll give you an answer. I don't. I just don't remember. Okay. So I'm not trying to skirt you. I just that doesn't sound like something I would do. Okay, and so uh, well, I mean, uh, that's why I'll have to go back. I wouldn't expect a little Labrador to do the same thing. Okay, well, and so I, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to sidestep it. I just don't, I don't recall that. So, but but we'll look into it, and, and uh, I'll, I will give you an answer in the back. What do you consider your biggest failure and your biggest success so far in Congress? Well, on the success front, um, it's it's been with our local, I, I won't even say me, but it's been the, the staff work. Uh, Mike was sharing with me yesterday, we, we had 470 some different cases through the constituent network where we've been successful in helping people mitigate the morass of what's called the federal government. And that's a whole broad array of <coughs> agencies, issues from BLM to Forest Service to Medicare to veteran services all the way across the board. And, and so to have successfully helped help people navigate those channels is a big win. And I, as, and I think there's a number in the, in the neighborhood of $300,000 that has, has been either, either returned or um, benefited by, by those 400 in some cases. So, it, especially in this environment, I'd say that's probably the uh, probably the the best thing that we've been able to do. Uh, uh, frankly, I think that we've been able to build some very good relationships too in uh, in that uh, in that body, both on the Republican and the Democrat side. And you have to do that uh, if if you're going to have any kind of progress, you've got to get credibility. You've got to to uh, spend the time. I show up early, I stay late, I go prepared as much as I humanly can be, and, and I don't, and this is strategic, I, I don't grandstand for the most part. I don't try to chase the, uh, the cameras. That will come in time, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to have an impact on that front. But you, you build those relationships. I think we've been reasonably good there, too. In terms of, of Probably the biggest failure. I don't, I don't feel comfortable that we're appropriately adding to the solutions of things. Um, I had the benefit of serving in the Idaho State Legislature for for ten years, and I think Sage will validate what I'm about to say. Your your vote is sometimes the least influential thing you have. <coughs> it's when you become either, through one form or another, you, you, you become a, a, a gatekeeper or you become a, maybe that's not the right word, you become influential on the front end before the legislation is written. And you're on the front end of that decision-making process. That's usually after you've established yourself as a solutions person. And we're not there yet, and I'm not there yet. Um, I need to be able to be, to have more constructive solutions, and uh, uh, just haven't haven't uh, got that done yet. 
I know there was, yes. I have a follow-up to something you said. And I think this is a wonderful microcosm of what Washington, D.C. is like. And I think it's so strange that we're all here from Bonner County. We all agree on most things about life. We agree what's good and what's not. And yet, I hear people say things from the news that I heard in an entirely different way. And so there's got to be a way that we can all depend on receiving factual information and, there, and without any spin. I mean, I think the partisanship is bringing our country to its knees. So how do we find the things that we have in common? I mean, to me, it has to happen here as well as, as you say, work by partisanship. Welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, but you, you know what? You're right. Um, I would flip it around. I think we in Congress are a microcosm of you. And we are elected by you. And I, I to the best of my ability, try to, to use the whatever brain cells the good Lord gave me, plus the knowledge and experience and the feedback that I get from people that I serve. And it is torn, you know, and so when I tell you things like, you know what, I don't recall that. I, I, I mean, it, it makes it makes sense, yeah. And so that's that's one thing. Or, or when the issue comes up, don't you think that, I think you asked the question, is, isn't uh, it was an obstruction of a piece of Well, uh, yeah, you know what, it, it, part of the detail. It could be in some circumstances, maybe not in others. These aren't black and white, these aren't black and white deals. I see the partisan divide every single day. In most cases, we're able to overcome it. In some, and right now, we're in one of those, everybody's just kind of tensed up over this, and I can see the defense shields popping up every time I walk into a, um, any kind of a committee hearing or, or everyone is just kind of on pins and needles. And so I think we're a microcosm of you. And at the end of the day, for me at least, the answer is trying to be as open and objective as I can, to try to be respectful of people. We are not going to agree on everything, but that doesn't mean you're wrong or that I'm right or vice versa. But for now, I'm you. And I, I know that some people will go, oh man, then we're in bad shape. But I really am, okay? <laughs> and I take that very, very seriously. And so I've shared with you, this is how I attempt to approach it. If you have a better solution, please let me know. But also talk to me and talk to our people. Uh, we want to we want to know what your concerns are, and but also understand too. Thanks to you, I am in it every single day. I'm a product of my life experience, just like you are, uh, and I'm going to use that experience to try to help make those decisions. But it's not going to be in a vacuum, and I take your input very, very seriously. But to your point, until we can figure out how to be adults in the room, and collectively we haven't, we'll be in this divide. Yes, sir. Uh, I read the Wall Street uh, Journal maybe once or twice a week in the library. Immediately after the election, there is an opinion, you know, on the opinion, on the opinion page of the Wall Street Journal about two elections in California for the House of Representatives. On the ninth election, the Republican was headed by about 10,000 or more votes. By the time the thing was all over, the Democrats went, what they said, mine votes and overturned those two elections. Now, what kind of stuff is that? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that there's a, there's a 
good answer, certainly from me on that. Probably see that happening both ways. And um, uh, I think I'm a familiar with at least one of the ones you're talking about, and it's highly suspicious. So in those cases, the best we could do is probably just try to go through that election process. And by the way, one of the bills, you know, somebody mentioned, uh, it might have been you, about uh, the number of bills that are cobbed up in the in, on McConnell's desk. One of those bills that I disagree with that passed and is cobbed up there is um, that would turn over all the elections to the federal government. It would not be it would not be handled by the states or the counties anymore. And that's that's not that's not the answer. I, how about Alan? Yeah. I just want to maybe help this gentleman. I was in California for the election on November 6th. In California, you do not have to show a driver's license or any ID to vote. Um, they've discovered 5 million fraudulent ballots in California. The county that I lived in, L.A. County, had 200,000 people vote who were dead. My congressman, had I not moved to Idaho, would have been Adam Schiff. Wow. Fraud is at a huge thing. Now, when you have four and a half million people that are illegally in California, and 50,000 a month were pouring, by the way, into California, the number of people in the state determines the number of congressmen that they have. And California went from 48 congressmen to 53. California has six to seven more congressmen than they should have because of, because of, uh, of uh, the number, because they use that in the census. And it's not, it's not a, it's not a uh, elementary thing because Montana, because of that, who had two congressmen lost one. We only have one. We in Idaho really should have three, but we have two. The corruption in California is so widespread, and the fight has to be in California because, believe me, these people are coming here. And it's called, to your answer, sir, it's called harvesting of votes. The California legislature that only has nine Republicans passed the law that said that their organizations can have up to 30 days after the election to bring in votes. So. Orange County, which was a, which was a bastion, I grew up there, was a bastion of conservative thinking. Four out of the five congressmen won, the Republicans won that night. One gal who was a wonderful Vietnamese gal, very sharp gal, she was up by 14,000 votes. 30 days later, magically, 14,500 votes came in. The, the, so I just want to sum it up that we as the citizens want to help you to fight ballot fraud, because that's what it was called. It was not mm -hmm. voter fraud, it was ballot fraud. And there are groups like, um, I think it is, there, there are groups that are, I think it's um, Judicial Watch. They were the ones that found the uh, five million fraudulent ballots. There are more ballots in California than people over the age of 18. So the thing is, we have the, as citizens, we have to be aware and we have to be in this fight. So what Alan was just talking about is really at the heart of the immigration issue. Um, the partisan divide on that front is that for the most part, and this is generalizing, but for the most part, the, uh, the Democrat leadership do not want a lot of constraints there. There, and there is a, a benefit that goes to that party as a function of the system of this, as it's set up. And I think what you're talking about is, <coughs> is an example of that. On the, on the flip side, the Republicans, for the most part, do want to see that because there is a rule of law that needs to be followed. Not only that, but there's been such a rush within the last year that uh, there's been just horrific examples of human rights issues, that, uh, you know, just personal things that have transpired with these immigrants trying to trying to get in, and uh, the trafficking that occurs, and the the, uh, the 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 drug crossing, and all that kind of stuff. But that's really at the root of the whole immigration debate. And frankly, for the most part, we've worked through a lot of that with a fair amount of bipartisan support. But it's just. 
just not able to get it on the on the agenda. So that, that's a good example. Let's go over here and then how much? Let's do let's do one more and I'll try to do a wrap up. So, I was going to make a quick comment. I'm okay. an immigrant and I came here legally and it's very very hard. It took years and I was a minor, so it is white people are coming. I grew up in a communist country where I have to stand in line to get bread and sugar to have a meal. And I don't agree with illegal immigration because of how hard I have to work. I would love to have my grandma here. I would love to have any of my other family members here. But I only have one, my mom. That's it. Sure. And everybody else is back home. You can't. Legally, I can't bring any of them. Just thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a perspective that most of us don't have. Let's do one more about Patricia because you haven't asked a question. Okay, it's self serving. I'll be up front. <laughs> Last night I went to a presentation about the over $500 billion that are generated by the arts. So we've already had this discussion many times about the arts as an economic generator. I'm just wondering if you had any opportunities to vote for funding for the arts or if that remains one of your considerations. It's, that's a consideration, but I, I'd like to tell you that there was something constructive going on, but it's, there's just not. Because we just get this feedback uh, that it's being it's, killed before it gets to you, and I just wondered if you had any insight information into that. I think it's, it's falling victim that many other things are right now. There's just not, there, there's just not a constructive agenda at all, in my opinion. So any of the work that we that we are able to do is going to be either directly through channels in our own state or through agencies directly, and and uh, I, I, I wish there was a better answer, but that's just that's the scenario as I see it. Folks, I'm gonna I'm gonna close up maybe just with this thought process. Um, this this whole thing that that we call politics or, or governance, I think is best defined as a struggle for influence. And that's what you see. That's what's playing out right now. I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but uh, you mentioned something about um, media and inability to work together. Media isn't Chancellor or Cronkite anymore. It's highly partisan, one way or the other. We don't, we don't get the objective facts through most channels. So we have to figure out other ways to get it. But we are in an ongoing struggle for influence. <coughs> and it was a struggle in 1776. And it was a struggle during the Civil War. <coughs> And I can tell you for sure, it is a struggle right now. And it's going to be a struggle when your kids and your grandkids and mine are in these seats and these seats. And it'll, it's going to, it has ebbed and flowed and it will continue to ebb and flow based on the people who fill the voids. That's one of the reasons why I got a special place in my heart for the Sage Dixons. And the, <coughs> And uh, Ken Lawrence is of uh, the world, and, and tell me your name one more time. Yes. Gary. Gary. Yes, those are elected officials, but it's also the citizenry. We don't live in a democracy. We live in a republic. And a republic has a couple of prerequisites if it's going to succeed over time. You have to be informed and you have to be willing to engage. I can promise you that there will be things moving forward that, you, that, that I wind up doing that you agree with. Equally, there's probably going to be things that I do that you don't agree with. I've tried to communicate how I come to those conclusions and we're going to continue to go down that path. But my point of saying all that is how, the, how things work out over the course of time and the influence they take is dependent upon those of you willing to engage in the struggle. Whether it's in your own sphere of influence at your work or 
church or, or office or whatever that might be, neighborhood, don't stop struggling. We're going to get through all this. I'd like to tell you it's going to happen soon. I don't think it's going to happen. Probably the next significant break won't be until the 2020 election. If there is not a successful impeachment in the short term, there'll be another Mueller or another. It, it'll it'll <laughs> continue to cycle around. That's how polarized things are. In the meantime, please know there is an effort to try to, to bridge gaps, build some relationships, do some constructing things, uh, constructive things in the meantime. But we are a microcosm of what's going on in society, and we are struggling. And my request to you all is please don't stop struggling. And please communicate your thoughts, your processes, and if you're so inclined, your prayers. And thank you for giving me some time today. We'll wrap it up.